Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's tech topic. I'm glad you could join us. We are going to be looking at desktop cutting machines today. My name is Lisa. I'm with the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library, and I'm going to look a little bit more in depth at what they are, how they work, kind of how to compare features and get started using them. So we'll go into details of what they are, kind of their background, how we got to use them and what they're used for today, some of their features, like how do they do what it is that they do, some tips to keep in mind and features to look for, and as mentioned, those quick start steps. So jumping right in with our what even is it, desktop cutting machines are those devices that sit right on top of uh, your table or desktop that let you cut things out automatically. They are basically uh, consumer grade CNC devices where we have a computer that tells our uh, device what to cut out. So think of it like a printer, but instead of putting ink on paper, it's using a small blade to cut things out of paper or vinyl or what have you. So what it's often used for is for crafting where folks are cutting things out of maybe vinyl to make into decals that you can use on, put on a car or on to personalize items or to cut out vinyl that can then be ironed onto t-shirts or similar. So a lot of crafting applications for it, um, very heavily for, for vinyl and paper and that sort of thing. Some of the devices, depending on how uh, robust their blades are and what height of a material that they can take, might even be robust enough to cut out very thin wood like balsa wood or uh, even leather. And some of them can not only cut, but they might be able to emboss or deboss where they create that raised pattern or uh, engraved pattern onto objects. They may even be able to score where it's only very lightly cut and it creates a, a very crisp folding line. So a lot of different applications, uh, definitely very heavily for crafting purposes. As you get the bigger, more robust devices, you might have uh, some more commercial applications with it. But definitely for projects like this. So the basics of how they work is you have a design on your computer and you use the software that comes with whichever device you're using to manipulate it and update it and have it in a format where the cutter can read it. And then you either send it wirelessly, some devices are Bluetooth or Wi-Fi enabled, or you directly plug your cutter into your computer using a USB cable. And you send that image to the cutter and that cutter will then start cutting out whatever you have uh, ready for it to, to use. We're going to look at some of the file examples and kind of how we adjust that. But one of the things that you'll want to keep in mind is that when you're creating these designs, simpler is going to be better. We'll show you some more details on that, but also keep in mind that anything that's not connected within the design may become floating. And if you're not using something that's sticky, it might just fall away. So as mentioned, some of those design that you create, if you're not careful and have things either attached or if you're using a sticky surface, you'll have a floating part of the design that uh, then doesn't transfer to the final product. So I'll show you a little bit what I mean by that when we pull up the software to look at it together, but just kind of keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is to choose the right uh, tool or device for the project that you're working on. So a lot of the devices, whether it's a Silhouette or a Cricut, whichever brand you're using, they usually will come with a different weight of a material. So they'll have a different level of stickiness for the pad or the mat that you attach what you're going to cut to. Uh, if it's a very, very sticky thing, then you'll not want to use that for a very delicate material because as you pull that off of the sticky pad, it'll then tend to rip or tear. And that same way, if you have something that's a very tough material, if you're cutting one of the thicker pieces and you have one of those more robust 
machines that can handle leather or balsa wood, you wouldn't want to use a light grip cutting mat because then it wouldn't be able to hold on to that tough or heavy object. To kind of match up the material that you're using to the actual cutting pad and the cutting blade. And uh, last, my last tip is the simple designs work best. You'll hear me say that again, but these machines are really designed to cut out silhouettes. Hence the silhouette cameo's name. Uh, they're designed to use outlines, so very simple outlines to make that pattern. Uh, sometimes making a layered pattern where it's very intricate, but it should always be a, a findable outline. So the simpler the design, the easier it's going to be to manipulate, especially when you're just getting started using the software. The other thing to keep in mind is to, if you're cutting out something that's small, for example, maybe you're cutting out a vinyl decal that you're going to put on like a travel mug. Be careful how small and intricate the design is, because if it's very, very intricate and detailed, sometimes those elements are so small that as the blade is going through and cutting the vinyl, it's almost the, you know, the, the design might be almost the width of the blade that you're using and it kind of jams up and it, it doesn't look super great if it's having trouble cutting through it because the design is just too small and detailed. So kind of watch the scale. Um, it helps if you're, when you're using the software, and I'll show you how to do this, if you have it in 100% size, so not zoomed in, not zoomed out, we're showing you the ac actual size that you're going to be cutting. That'll help you avoid having things that are too small and too detailed where it'll get lost when you cut that out. Same with the over under designs. Celtic knots are a really beautiful, great design, but sometimes you can struggle cutting those out of a silhouette design because that over under overlap that you might see in an actual picture or a, a stylized rendering unless you're very careful with how those cut lines are showing up on the software, it's gonna have a hard time telling where to cut and you'll lose that over under effect of it. So keep that in mind, there are ways to do it, um, but it definitely takes a lot of practice to learn where to use those settings. So that's something that gets easier with time and with practice. And we'll take a quick look at how to get started with this as well. I'll show you a quick example here of a project where I had a sticky mat that was just too sticky for the material that I was using. I was using a medium grade cardstock here and I had a very sticky pad. And when I peeled it off, you see how it kind of bent and distorted the paper because it was just hanging onto it too hard. And this is also an example of how the when we pull it up after we've cut it out, you see what stays behind. So in this case, I lost all of the detail of the inner workings of these gears because they weren't attached to the outside. So when I pulled it off, everything that was inside stayed behind. So just a couple of things to keep an eye on. And again, we'll pull up the software as soon as we're through this part of the program. We'll pull the software up and we'll look at it together. So here are some of the features to look for if you're um, looking to, to borrow one from a friend that might have uh, something that you could use for a project or if you're looking to maybe purchase one. These are some of the things that I would keep an eye out for when making those considerations. So the first thing is with the machine size. Most brands, uh, their models aren't whether the model itself can uh, is fancier and has more features. The biggest difference between most brands' models is how wide it is, because the the width of the machine is the maximum width that you can cut. So where you might be able to cut a really really long design, as long as you had a long roll of vinyl, for example, you could only cut uh, as wide as that machine is. So kind of keep that in mind if you're you know doing something that's just for fun, for crafting, that kind of a thing. In most cases, the regular uh, basic uh, model would be plenty. But if you were looking at doing this where you're really making some uh, decals for maybe a home business or something, and you needed those decals to be 
of a more substantial size, you might want to consider looking at a machine that is that has that wider width so that you could cut things that are taller or have that can take vinyl and sheets that were bigger than, say, the 12 inch uh, average one. As mentioned, the length, the only thing that's limiting that for most machines is how long of a roll of vinyl you have. And that depth, the cutting depth is also an important measurement to keep an eye out. Um, most machines will have a very standard um, depth as in you know, top to bottom from where that blade is going down. If it's a machine that's meant to handle more robust material, like I mentioned, your balsa wood or leather or anything like that, a lot of times those will have a higher setting and they'll be able to take a blade that has a more uh, a more robust blade that might go down farther. And it can take a sheet of material that's a thicker sheet of material than you know, say just a regular piece of vinyl. So that's the other size consideration to really look for. Um, in most cases, if we're just talking about cutting vinyl and paper for craft hobby type things, the average regular model for most brands is going to be fine. But if we're doing a lot more specialized work, uh, definitely keep an eye on some of those other dimensions. All of them, pretty much any consumer grade desktop cutter that you would find is going to be able to cut cardstock, vinyl, anything like that that could be attached to one of their sticky sheets, for example. Anything that's thin like that is going to work fine on any of these commercial uh, home devices. If you're maybe a quilter or someone who's going to be cutting out a lot of fabric pieces, this is where you, you'll need to pay a little bit more attention to. Most of them can cut out fabric that has had a backing ironed onto it that gives it more stability. In a lot of cases, they'll have a special cutting blade that you put into the desktop cutter that might be like a rotary blade that cuts through fabric a little bit easier. But most of them can take fabric to varying, varying thicknesses and sturdinesses as long as they've had that uh, stabilizing backer attached. There are some of the newer ones that don't require that backing but that's that's still kind of hit or miss. And uh, from what I've read on consumer reports and other uh, resources, reviews are a little bit mixed on the ability to cut fabric without that backing. So if anybody's tuned in tonight that has played with these, uh, some already might have already tried cutting up fabric, let me know in the chat if you've had any success with that yet. And again, some of that heavier material, balsa, leather, that kind of thing. Those are a little bit more specialized and you have to really pay attention to the, the machine, whether it can handle that kind of a thickness or weight of material. Well, let's take a quick look at the ones that we usually have in library branches. Now, every branch is not gonna have the same machines. We have different machines throughout the county. Um, Overwhelmingly, most branches that have a desktop cutter for programs will have the Silhouette brand, but there are a handful of branches that also use a Cricut. Fundamentally, they all work very much the same. Their software is very similar, so if you get started using one device, it's not a problem to start using a different device later on, or if you attend a program at one branch, uh, what you've learned there will still be helpful if you, learn, if you use a device at a different branch. So for the Silhouette, their software is the same for all of their devices. Uh, if you're using a Cricut, they have their own brand of device. That's going to be a little bit different. But again, the difference between the software is generally lines up with the brand, not the specific device. So here's a quick look at what those look like. I've got my quick uh, start guide up on the screen here. We're not going to go through this in detail. Uh, this is more for if we were uh, doing a hands-on class at a library that it would be helpful, uh, but I'll have it up here in the background. What I would love is I'm going to switch my screen over to the silhouette screen. So if you have questions already on anything that we've talked about so far, um, if you have any troubleshooting that you might need help with, 
put that in the chat box for me and I will keep an eye on that while we're looking at the more hands on demonstration. Let me know. I would be happy to troubleshoot it with you while we're live on the program. Now, well, let me switch my screen over here. There we go. All right, so I mentioned that we always want to be cautious when we use our images that we're using a relatively simple design that is not floating where the pieces and parts are attached. So I'll see if I can find a couple of files here that we can use to demonstrate this. So all I'm doing is I'm doing a quick drag and drop of a picture that I found quickly. Dropping that onto here. And this will be a good way to show you what I mean by those floating parts. So on these gears here, this black is what we're looking to have left behind. So we're going to try to cut the outline of all these parts so that when we pull away the white excess, it's only leaving this black part behind. Now here, all of these black parts are connected. So when we cut it out and peel it off, it's still one whole thing. On this one down here, however, you see how this center part with the extra circles here, you see how that is not connected to the outside part of the gear? That means that when I cut this out and peel it out, if I'm using paper or something where it's not going to be sticky, this is going to pull up as two separate pieces. And it can be tricky to line those back up. But if we cut it out and then use our tools to pull up those white scraps around the edges on the inside, and it's still on that sticky mat before we pull it off of the sticky mat, we can use a transfer film, which is basically like, like a scotch tape, but not quite as sticky, to peel that up very carefully. And if we're using vinyl, that's how we're gonna then stick it onto our surface. But if we don't use that kind of a transfer film to pull it off of the sticky mat while it's still together, the center part is just gonna be free floating. You'll only be left with that outside edge. So that's, that's kind of what I meant by make sure your design is connected and not floating, especially when you're first getting started. That can be one of the more frustrating and tricky parts. So assuming that this is the design I want to use, I've just dragged and dropped it onto my software here. And then you can start playing with your settings for outlining it. Now, if you're someone who uses Adobe Illustrator or any other uh, design software, you might have software that can already create a PNG file that has uh, that's already pre-outlined, basically. That's great. I love it because that skips all of these steps here of importing the image and then using the software to create that outline. I'm going to just pick our trace area to get that outline started on this one. Apparently, it is not wanting to cooperate, and we'll try it there. My software is being a little bit slow. There we go. So I just picked a part of it. So when it shows you the preview of the trace area, everything that's showing up in yellow is what will then be part of your design. Oh, that did not go. My software is not having a good day. My, my computer is being a little bit slow. Bear with me if we can get that to fix. If you have those questions, do go ahead and put those right in the chat so we can troubleshoot them on the fly. I'd rather, I'd rather talk about something that you want to look at than poke at an example that might not be giving you the information that you need. 
All right, there we go. So on this one, you'll see I dragged it onto there and I created the outline. The outline that's left behind on most software, including the silhouettes, will show up as a red outline. So once I have my design on there, I use that trace function. And once it looks the way that you want to look at, you want it to look, you can adjust it, you can move it around within that design. You don't have to keep it, you know, in proportion to it, each other like that. And once it looks the way you want it to do, and you have your device hooked up and attached to your computer, you hit that send button up here and it pulls up this menu. And that will let you adjust your settings for how deep you want that blade to cut, uh, what kind of paper or material that you're cutting. It lets you adjust all of these settings. The best thing that you can do when you are using maybe a new type of vinyl or new device is to test that, um, that blade setting. So whatever the default is that it sets to, do a little test cut with this function right here. It's a little triangle here. If, you, if that test cut goes all the way through, you know that you've got a good blade setting, but if it's not peeling up quite right, maybe it's catching on the edges, just adjust those settings for how deep the blade goes and how many times you want it to cut over that same surface. I'll get our little example here going. So the design I just showed you, this is basically what it turned out. Just a little paper lantern that I made, cut out the design with that, put some tissue paper behind it, and there we go. You'll see on the that first side of it, with that detail down there, it was just too tiny to cut out nicely. Because when it's when it's so fine and detailed and so small, it just can't keep up and it kind of jams and binds up. So just wanted to see that wanted you to see what that looks like on there. But yeah, that's our quick little example. So I am going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the library tools that we have to get yourself started with this. As I mentioned, most of the libraries that do have the silhouettes or the desktop cutters have that silhouette brand. Um, there are a handful that have the crickets instead. Uh, what you'll want to do is look on the library events calendar, hcplc.org slash events. That's where you're going to find a lot of our technology classes and that sort of thing. And the best way to get started is to just attend one of those classes where they maybe will make an, uh, have a specific project that you'll work on together. Some of them may have open lab time where uh, once you go through an orientation, you're able to use their devices. It's going to be a little bit different from location to location, but hcplc.org slash events is where you'll find that. I picked out a couple of uh, classes that, that'll give you a little bit more in-depth training on using some of these uh, design software. So depending on what you're trying to do, if you're using images that you're creating from scratch, a lot of times you're gonna use a software that's similar, uh, that's like Adobe Illustrator or similar. Those can get really expensive, so we do have some libraries that have uh, the full Adobe suite in the library where you could use that there instead. But to get the most out of that time, I picked out a couple of classes to really hone those skills. So Learn T-shirt printing and design was a really interesting uh, class that they had on LinkedIn Learning that specifically was looking at you know your design for vinyl and how to adjust those kinds of settings specifically for those kinds of projects. So that was that was a lucky find. You can see on LinkedIn Learning, they always have how long those classes are. So this was just a quick 24, uh, 25, 26 minute class on that. I also found one for on Adobe Illustrator for people like me who might be making a design for an activity, but I'm not a professional illustrator. I don't use these um, this kind of software all the time but I definitely need to know how to use the basics of it and how to get started with it. So this is a three and a half hour class that really goes in depth on how to use uh, Adobe Illustrator if you're not someone who's a design person by trade. Now, 
that's a big number that can be kind of intimidating to see that and go, oof, I don't know about you. I don't have three and a half hours to dedicate to uh, learning all the stuff that I might not need, but that's okay. You just click on the class and you can actually just uh, look at or view the sections that actually apply to the specific skill that you might be trying to learn. So don't be intimidated by the time commitment on those. That is very flexible. You don't have to do them in order. You can you know, just do one right in the middle. You don't have to do all of them to get to the end one. Same with this one, oof, five and a half hours. The big training, it's great. It really gives you those core skills. But if you're just looking at picking up a specific one, just go to the chapter that has that information that you need. Another great way to get some more specific training for the device that you're using at home is to go to that manufacturer site. So most brands that have devices like this, desktop cutters, they're gonna have tutorials and courses that are built into their website. So a lot of times the beginning ones, uh, the beginner ones, the introductory ones are gonna be free. Uh, and those are generally enough to get you up and running with the, the basic skills. I see a lot of them that have uh, more in-depth classes or classes for specific projects where they might charge a fee. Your mileage may vary. I, I, I tend to find uh, just as good of information for that kind of thing on, on YouTube or other free places. Uh, so I don't know that I would necessarily buy those classes but their, their free introductory classes are sometimes really great for getting those basic skills. That pretty much wraps up our topic today. I'm gonna point you at our Tech Topics uh, page, hcplc.org slash Tech Topics. That has information on all of the programs that we do as part of this Tech Topics series. You can catch up on previous episodes there and see what other ones we might have coming up. That page is also going to have information on our technology specific classes that we have in branches. So at a library near you, uh, one of our branches, we have technology programs going on all the time. And a quick way, a shortcut way to get to that is to just go to our tech topics page. And that'll have a, a link to all of our upcoming tech events right on there. And of course, we post all of our virtual programs on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash Tampa Hills Live. Uh, great way to catch up on this episode. We usually have them posted there within a week or so of the live program. So if you ever miss a live event, you can always catch up there. All right, I don't see a ton of questions coming in yet, but give me another shot. If you have a, a question on troubleshooting, using a desktop cutter, if you're not sure where to get started, Anything, uh, don't be shy, type that into the chat box. I'm happy to talk through it. If you want to reach out to us after the program, if you think of a question later, hcplc.org slash contact has all of our contact information on it. Or give us a call at 813-273-3652. So I'm looking at the chat over here. I see someone uh, is happy that I'm using the Silhouette software because they have used the Cricut design software before. Yes, I, I don't have the Cricut one loaded up in the background right now. Uh, I, I've used both and I think they're both, just from my hands-on experience with them, I haven't used the Cricut as often, but it's very, very similar. So even if some of the layout might be different on where you find things in the menu, generally speaking, the what they call the things will be the same. And their buttons that the little graphic that you would click on to get to a specific tool is very similar from one brand to another. So that's really helpful when you switch between devices like this. I'll say the Silhouette Studio, it can be hit or miss depending on what device you're using in terms of how responsive it is. It can, like we saw today, it can hang up a little bit if you're trying to do a lot with it at once. So with the live stream that we're doing here and the, the program that we have up in the background, sometimes that software can uh, hang up a little bit if you're trying to do too much at once. 
I I'm going to assume that Cricut is very similar, that if you're, if you're trying to do a lot at the same time, it might not be super happy with you. But uh, just something to keep in mind if you're working on design, always save as you go. So that way, if it kind of crashes like mine did, you can just restart it and pick up right where you left off. OK, we have a question about the Makerspace class at the John F. Germany Library. So that is not a class that I'm teaching, uh, but somebody at the John F. Germany Library, uh, it, one of their staff is going to be teaching it. I, I work out of a, a different building, but uh, yeah, we always love getting that introductory class to our makerspaces. Because our makerspaces are very unique to the specific space, it's going to be a different experience if you have the class there versus one of the other branches just because the very specific devices that they have might be a little bit different. So it's always good to go to the branch that's closest to where you would normally be going. But if you're just looking for that introductory getting started with the device, I mean, anywhere works. Like I said, these are all very, very comparable devices in terms of how they, they work with each other and how similar they are to each other. Uh, and the person asked, would this class be helpful for someone who has no experience at all? Yes, so the, the makerspace orientation is going to be a rather broad orientation where they're more showing you how to get into the space, how to sign up for the classes, how to get started with the devices. So while you ne don't necessarily have had to ever use them before, it's more about learning how to use the space at the library with that specific device. So it's not going to go into a ton of detail about the nitty gritty of using it. So it's a good, definitely the right place to get started if you plan to use that makerspace in the future. But it's not going to give you a very in-depth class on using one specific device because they're going to be showing back in that class, they're going to be showing you all the devices that they have there. Uh, so someone else mentioned that, that Cricut has uh, has fees to use some of its software um, and asks that Silhouette has a, has a cost as well. Silhouette has, um, they have the basic software that comes with the device. It, you don't even have to buy the device. You could just download the Silhouette software from their website. And their basic software is free. There's no charge to it. Um, they have... I want to say one or two tiers of paid upgrades uh, for like a professional version of the software or business version of the software. And that has some additional features uh, that might not be available in the basic package. But I have honestly not found a huge amount of features that would be necessary for most folks using this at home as a hobby. Um, I think if you start to become, you know, a very frequent heavy user of the device, at that point you might find it worthwhile to upgrade to one of the paid software, but you don't necessarily need it. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that as the desktop cutters become more advanced, in a lot of cases you don't necessarily need to use the uh, device software at all. So what I mean by that is some of the newer devices, you could save the file. If you already had the image as a PNG file with the outline data already in there, you could have that on a USB flash drive or plugged into your computer and send that specific file directly from the computer or the USB drive to the cutter and set your size that you want it to be right on the cutter interface. I don't necessarily know if Cricut does that as well. I would assume that some of their newer ones have that feature as well. I know the Silhouette has been able to do that since their previous models, not the current one that just came out, but the one that came out before. Um, that does, however, assume that you have some kind of Illustrator software, whether it's a free or an Adobe one that can create those uh, image files for you as a PNG or FPG type file. All right, well, we're, we're going to start wrapping up our Q&A here. I'm keeping an eye out on the questions if anything else comes in in the 
next minute or so, but thank you all so much for joining us today. It was great having you here. Thank you for your great questions. That's super helpful to everyone attending and watching this recording later. We always appreciate that. And as mentioned, if you think of a question later, just reach out. We're happy to help you. And we look forward to seeing you at the library in one of our maker spaces using these gadgets. So check out those learning resources and we will see you soon. Night friends. <laughs>